great, great pleasure that I introduced you, Professor Brun de Cordier, from the University of Ghent. You ended up in the University of Ghent through quite an unusual trajectory, uh, starting from the humanitarian sector. And uh, today you will be talking about the imprints of an ideological empire about the Islamization of Central Asia, the first very true. Uh, thanks a lot. So I confirm, my name is Bruno de Cordier, professor at Ghent University, has a background in uh, political science history, and that is actually going to be the framework uh, of my contribution now. Uh, I'm the last one. Everything has an end, and at the end you'll spend with me. Thank you for bearing with that. Uh, Right, the imprints of an ideological empire, dynamics and actors in the Islamization of Central Asia. This is what you got in the program. Now, maybe when some of you uh, saw that title, you may have thought about something else than what I'm going to entertain you with for the next two hours. The Islamization of Central Asia, if you put the terms Islamization and Central Asia in the matrix, in your machine, and you push on search, you will likely get a number of materials referring to much more recent developments. That means the real and perceived re-Islamization of the regions and sometimes hysterically alarmist reports about that that has been going on since the early 1990s. The re-identification of at least a certain percentage of the population with Islamic religion and Islamic ideology. This is actually ongoing, this is relevant, but that is a process of more recent re-Islamization. What I'm going to talk about is the original Islamization of Central Asia. And I'm going to take you to a period that has been a couple of years ago, really. Uh, roughly, you have to situate it between 630, 650 and the year 1000. This is what I'm going to treat. This is also what I'm treating in the handbook. And the chapter here, or the lecture here, is also based on one of the chapters in my course on Central Asian history, which starts from one central question, how did Central Asia acquire its current cultural and political geography? And then I treat actually four key periods, this being actually the first, uh, the, the very first uh, one. And then it continues, the Islamization of Central Asia from the Arab frontier colonies to the Tahirid and Samanid governorate dynasties. Now you can say, I mean, he's taking us back to a time frame that was 1000 to 1350 years ago. All these people who live through that are long dead. This has an advantage because they can no longer contradict you. Uh, and all these civilizations and states, they're gone. So what is actually the relevance of all this? Actually, the relevance is really there. For one, we will actually treat the process of arrival of the Islamic religion and ideology in the region, and then gradually how it spreads. I mean, when you look at the cultural map of Central Asia today, you will see that sizable percentages uh, majorities in all countries and societies, majorities of the population, do self-identify to one degree or another with Islam. A lot of it has to do with ethnic Muslimness rather than with practice, but anyway, it is there. Secondly, you have certain percentage where you see a more active degree of practice. It is very important also to underline that self-identification with a confessional system is not automatically translated in active religiosity. But anyway, you see that all over the region, the Islamic notion is quietly intertwined with ethnicities and other identity frameworks. Now, Islam did not originate in the region. It originated far outside from it. Then how it arrived in Central Asia. Some people have loose ideas about Arab invasions, yes. Interaction with the Arab sphere, what was it? But then again, all these things, these actors, we will uh, treat in the, in, the, in the presentation. Where you will see different patterns popping up from initial, highly militarized enclave Islamization to a process where you see that the Islamic ideology became indigenized 
And the latter process is actually the crucial explanatory, um, explanatory, uh, explanatory factor in what you will, uh, in, the, in the transformation of Central Asia in that, uh, in that field. Then another relevance is that we will talk about processes and periods that, uh, during which parts of Europe were confronted with the same. The period that I've been of time, or the historical time slot I've been mentioning, is also the one where parts of Europe were confronted with Islamic invasions. Not in the least Spain, and then where, where it ended up in a centuries-long uh, occupation before the Christian resistance push, pushed it, uh, it out. And then you have, of course, other parts of the Mediterranean Basin who were uh, affected, with, uh, affected with, uh, with it all. So, this image is not from the period, it's 13th century, but I thought it was uh, comprehensive and strong enough to serve as an, uh, as an illustration. In fact, when we will talk about the original Islamization of Central Asia, the general time slot I already mentioned to, uh, to you, there are a number of phases you can distinguish into that which have their own process, their own dynamics, and their own distinctive actors. On the basis of available literature, a first phase that will come forward here is one roughly between 650 and 700. Hmm? That is the early medieval period. What happened there? You see that Central Asia, or at least the sedentary areas of Central Asia nowadays, roughly belonging to um, southern Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and also a part of Tajikistan, and then also the region of Herat. We will soon show a map, then you can orient yourself a bit uh, better. Central Asia was merely an appanage in another process, that is the Muslim Arab conquest of Iran. Because when you analyze the patterns of world economy, interaction, etc., you will see that in the pre-Islamic period there was actually very little direct interaction between Central Asia proper and the center, the cradle of the Islamic ideology, which was Western Arabia and the Red Sea region. You can think maybe that they were connected through the trade and caravan uh, route systems. That was not the case. Islam actually came through an intermediary region, and that was Iran and further to the west, Iraq. Keep that always in mind, because that has been basically the tiré, the trait d'union between the core, original core of Islamic ideology and then uh, the, the sedentary heartland of, uh, of Central Asia. By the way, I've been mentioning Islamic ideology several times already. The question can come up, uh, is Islam an ideology instead of a religion? I see it as an ideological system, as many religions are. Why is that? Because confessional system religions throughout history had a double function. The first one was actually to inform, to frame the relationship between the physical individual, the community and societies with the transcendental, with everything that has no material emanation. It informs May or explains uh, why people are here, the concept of the afterlife, compensation in the afterlife, and so on, the transcendental. But religions, confessional systems throughout history had another function that are not easy to imagine these days, especially not in Western Central Europe with its far-reaching secularizations, that is, that they also had a political theology. That means not merely philosophies, not merely mysticism, but also a whole range of precepts on how to organize society. A whole range of legal systems. That is, that, that, that is the case in the Islamic religion and ideology, and traditionally this was the same with the different systems of Christianity. Eh? This, uh, including in Western, Central, and also Eastern Europe. So that for the first phase. Then we have phase two, roughly situated between the year 700 and the year 820. We are still in the early Middle Ages, slowly going to the high medieval period. What happened then? That is that 
Central Asia, and I'm talking about Southern Central Asia, the parts I just mentioned, gradually became integrated in a specific form of empire, an Islamic empire. We will soon see what relevant no notions we have to keep in mind to explain that, uh, that, uh, that process. You see in the region the establishment and the consolidation of first the Umayyad and then the Abbasid imperial rule. A specific imperial rule which was very much intertwined with the concept of the caliphate. Let me tell you something, we will soon see what it means in, uh, in, uh, in practice. You had some sort of mixed form of both classical empire and very Islamic notions of territoriality and polity, in which Central Asia became then integrated as a sort of periphery initially. And then the third phase, and the most important, and the one that explained actually the full, or uh, uh, partly explains the full uh, or majority Islamization of Central Asia, that is situated between 820 and the year 1000, roughly. Yeah? What happened then? That is a period already beyond the direct Arab caliphal rule. You see the emergence of so-called governorate dynasties. Empires function as they function, and in the end they also disintegrate through their very functioning and their very extent. In that process, in the early 9th century, you already saw that people, elites, who were appointed governors by the center, start slowly to obtain their independence and create their own emirates, as it was called. The Tahirid uh, Emirate was the first one. You can roughly situate it, it started around 820 and it didn't last that, uh, that long, but then it was succeeded around 875 by the Samanid Emirate, which is actually much more known to people following uh, Central Asia. But these two were very instrumental in the Islamization of Central Asia. Now, what, what was characteristic for them is that they were indigenous dynasties. So no longer Arab rulers. Yes, culturally they were Arabized, they spoke Arabic, uh, they, they, they took over many uh, habits and institutions from Arab Islamic uh, empires, but they were actually carriers of an Iranian Central Asian Muslimness. And if you translate this to actual relevance, uh, there is something ironic about the role of the Samanids, because uh, if you hear the Samanid Emirate, the people of the, those of you who have been to Tajikistan, uh, you will remember that the Samanid Emirate is actually a key component in the secular nation building in Tajikistan. You see all the symbols and the, the references everywhere. Eh? It is important in a nation building process, a secular nation building process. Now what I will often not tell you in that specific example is that the Samanids were jihadis, Sunni jihadis. There is a literature about that uh, by Deborator and Etienne de la Vessière, and they illustrate that very well on the basis of documentation, historiography, archaeological evidence. But one component of the Samanid Emirate was a um, proactive Sunni Islamization of the sedentary parts of Central Asia and already the beginning of the Islamization of the steppe with which they uh, in, uh, interacted. Wilkinson also mentions these two, two periods, like the Tahirid and the Samanid uh, Emirate, as a period where Central Asia acquired civilizational autonomy. And that's also another important uh, concept in this whole uh, uh, discussion uh, here in the history of Central Asia. Civilizational autonomy, that is a situation where Central Asia was actually a political cultural center rather than being a periphery or an appendage in a greater space and empire, the center of which was situated outside of the region. There have been a number of periods like that, where Central Asia was a center. Wilkinson mentions the Tahirid and especially Samanid Emirates as examples of Central, Asia, uh, of Central Asian civilizational autonomy. There have been other periods. I think the Seleucid Empire, which came from the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great, so when he died his generals divided 
the territory among themselves and they founded their own empires. There you saw clearly Central Asia as a component in a Greek-influenced civilizational uh, project. Another period or example, uh, much further back, where C uh, Central Asia had civilizational autonomy, may have been the Scyth, the Saka. That was a nomadic empire situated in the Black Sea, Caspian area, and at a certain moment also in present day Kazakhstan. It was nomadic then and semi, um, and semi, uh, semi nomadic. Then there's also a fourth phase, which I will not treat here, but I will mention it for the sake of completeness, because that was uh, basically the end piece, the crown on the total Islamization of Central Asia. That is a phase situated between 960 and 1220, which some author called the Turkic Islamization phase. What happened there? First of all, uh, you see an accelerated Islamization of the steppe cultures, which were predominantly Turkic then racially and linguistically and, uh, and uh, culturally. Secondly, during that last fourth phase, you see the emergence of Turkic Muslim states. The Karakhanid state around uh, Kashgar, Uzgen and Balasagun, uh, two, uh, first two cities still exist. The other one is near Bishkek in the north of Kyrgyzstan. You can still see some uh, foundations. That was actually the first Turkic Islamic entity even before the Ottomans. Yeah? It's also during that fourth phase that Central Asian Sufism comes into being and plays a very important role in anchoring Islamic ideology in the region and in the, in the, in the steppe. At the same time, during that fourth phase, you see the Hanafi school of law, it was mentioned uh, earlier, being anchored in Central Asia, becoming dominant in Central Asia. And the fourth phase, 960, around 1200, is also the period where you see the Islamization of Eastern Central Asia, the, the area which is nowadays known as Xinjiang, eh? situated the People's Republic of, um, of uh, China. That is where actually these oasis cultures there got, um, got, uh, got Islamized. So generally the space we are talking about is this. I think it's a very nice conceptual map that uh, where several periods are being, uh, being shown. But initially for the period that interests us here, the part of Central Asia involved was this part. Where you see the oasis of Merv, now situated in uh, Turkmenistan, and then the river oasis cultures situated nowadays in Uzbekistan, southern uh, Tajikistan, and the area of... Uh, of, uh, of Herat. This is a very important concept. And if we uh, go a little bit, what we discuss here is in terms of conquest, in terms of impact of military conquest, is a process with specific character characteristics. We will soon uh, get a bit more into details of uh, a military expansion movement that started in the Arab or Western Arabia, then moved into Iraq, from Iraq went into Iran and then Central Asia, where conquerors came. They established a certain, uh, a certain presence and a rule for a certain period of time, but they left an ideology a confession, institution, and also a language, the influence of which lasted much longer than their physical presence and then their actual rule. This is a quite different pattern from certain other conquerors. Take, for example, we switch to Western and Central Europe, the Vikings and the Magyars, who invaded Western and Central Europe in the ninth uh, centuries in different waves. They invaded, they established a presence, but what happened is that eventually they took over the religion of the people they had conquered. They became Christians, yeah? from their or original animist pagan system. We go back to Central Asia, then 13th century, starting in 1219. The Mongols, you know that, certainly familiar with that period. They invaded Central Asia, they established dynasties there, but what happened is that these dynasties 
and also the grassroots eventually took over the religion of the people they had conquered. Many of these dynasties Islamized and mixed up and assimilated into the cultures they had subjugated. Not so here, it's the other way around. We, have, we deal with conquerors who left an ideology, institution, also the Arabic language, the influence of which still lasts in many loanwords in the region uh, languages, uh, that even long many centuries after their presence. Are there other examples of such a process? Yes. Uh, if we uh, rewind a little bit back into history before Christ, or e even before and uh, after Christ, this has happened with Roman civilization in the Mediterranean Basin and in large parts of Western Europe. In fact, Roman culture, Roman institutions, the Latin languages, the influence of that lasted much longer than the existence of the Western Roman Empire. That's another example. Then we go even back further, the Greeks, Alexander the Great. Well, he was not alone to do that, he had many people around him, an army and vassals, etc. But even long after his death, the Greek oriental civilization he helped found lasted uh, or had an influence on many terms, many levels, uh, cultural level, institutions, etc. Coming back on that concept, this is a nice piece of work basically. That is, um, it is a concept or a, a graphic uh, authored by Richard William Bulliet and his conversion curve. Yeah. What you see there, based on the source you have there, is a, a graphic representation of the grassroots Islamization of Iran. You may say, yeah, Iran, but we're talking about Central Asia here. Remember what I said, Iran was the intermediary for Islam to Central Asia. You will soon see why that was so important. And what happened in Iran, sooner or later, trickled over into Central Asia. At least, again, it's sedentary agricultural societies and, um, and, uh, and civilizations. Actually, you can extrapolate that partly. What you see is, in terms of, on the left, percentage of the population having become Muslim or identifying itself with Islam. And what you see here are two timelines. That is Anno Domini, that is the Christian calendar, and the Hijra or Islamic calendar, which is different from the mainstream that we use and starts much later on the basis of a, different, uh, of a different year. Now, the first thing, if you take the 50% mark, so when you already reach a narrow majority of people in Iran who have converted to Islam, then you, and, and you project that to uh, the year that the 50% mark has been reached, it took about 170 years after the arrival of the Arabs. And it was already reached when the Arab caliphal imperial rule was on the wane, so was slowly collapsing. That reflects one thing, that is that others took it over, that it indigenized, that local actors championed the Islamic cause. And then you see the almost full Islamization of Iran under the succeeding, uh, the succeeding uh, dynasties. Now, the model has not been without its critics uh, because, of course, technically, it is not easy to make. On what sources do you base that? I mean, we're talking about periods of history where there was no statistics, no censuses. In fact, uh, the census, the Peripis Nacelenie, is a very recent concept. Every few years you do it. In Western Europe, it was generalized in the Napoleonic period and in Central Asia, even in the Soviet Union. Eh? The regular uh, census. So that was not available. Eh? So on what basis is it then made on historiography, uh, chronicles, on uh, the analysis of personal names? Where you see that one generation has a traditional Iranian name and then their sons and grandsons, because it's mostly they who appear in chronicles, have then Arabized or Muslim names. It has been a hell of an exercise, which is not waterproof, Absolutely not waterproof, it has been criticized. But in any case, this is something we can do with. And it reflects very much the importance of indigenization than following military concept and enclave, um, and enclave uh, 
Islamization. You see also that for parts of Central Asia, Xinjiang, it took even much longer, beyond the year uh, 1000. Now, now come back to later, this. The concepts of territoriality and polity that are relevant in this, uh, in this, uh, in this story. There's a number of things that are at play here. Uh, I spoke about an Islamic empire, an Arab Islamic empire. Was actually the characteristic, the paradigm of empire applicable? Yes, was one component. The second is typical Islamic notions of territoriality and polity that are at play and that determine the character or the place that Central Asia had in the Islamic order. First, what we see is that in the Umayyad and Abbasid period, Central Asia definitely became part of a classical pre-modern empire, which has, on the basis of the work of Maurice Duverger in Le Concept d'Empire, which is actually an excellent work for those who read French, I don't think it has been translated in uh, other languages, but besides a theoretic approach, it gives about 20 examples of historical empires and their DNA and the way they were constituted and their uh, characteristics. A first characteristic of empire is a sort of complementarity of unifying institution and a high level of diversity. In fact, what you will see, and this was the case here, is that sociologically, culturally, empires, you may associate that with modern colonialism, with cultural imperialism, etc., was not the case in pre-modern empires. Empires were by nature very diverse. Ethnically, in terms of institutions, languages, etc. There were gigantic patchworks of cultures. Nonetheless, unified by a superstructure, reflected by a dynasty, an ideological project, and other factors of legitimacy. And kept together also, and this was very typical also in this case, by the military, a high degree of militarization, road networks, and communications and postal systems. Exactly the same happened in then when parts of Central Asia were integrated then in the Umayyad and Abbasid order. So you have that, the classical notion of empire applicable here. Nonetheless, what makes it specific? That is that there were also typical Islamic concepts of territory and political organization at work. I mention a few with their Arabic transcription. The first one is the Ummah, yeah? the global community of believers, which is not territorially but ideologically identified. Everyone subscribing to Islamic ideology is part of that. So it's not a notion of territory. And you see already a first contradiction. The empire with its territorial notion, the Ummah which converse in it, the thing is that the Ummah is actually as a concept meant to apply ideally to the whole of humanity. Because Islam being expansionist, Islam being universal in its message, the idea is that the Ummah will one day, or this is what they hope, one day include the whole of humanity. Second important institution is the Caliphate. I mean, it's now uh, a concept taken up by many political militant groups. But historically, the caliphate refers to the worldly successor of the Prophet Muhammad as the leader of the Ummah. Now, there have been several dynasties, several lines between the year uh, 622 and 1924. Initially, uh, it was based in Medina, moved to, uh, moved to Iraq. But the important thing, and that brings us back to the concept of empire, of which Central Asia was part, that is that from the Umayyads onwards in 662, when they took over, it became an imperial dynasty. So caliphs became hereditary em emperors, yeah? instead of being elected as it was before. Not by the general public, but by a council. This is how they did it. The reason why is that they probably copied that system as a caliph emperor from the Byzantines, the Greeks, who had the idea of an emperor as the protector of the Christians. 
And once the Umayyads installed themselves in Syria, which was Christian Byzantine territory, they took over that institution. And that is also something very typical for empire. Rulers who came in from the outside, yeah, they set up a governance system. But to do that, they have to co-opt local systems of governance. Because the societies they rule over are very different than their own. And if they want to rule this more or less efficiently, they have to co-opt and local rulers, local courts, local institutions from different cultural spheres. This is also what happened in early Islamic rule in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Central Asia. And then you have three ideas of territoriality, which are more specifically Islamic. And, uh, part of Islamic political theology. The first is the Dar al-Islam, which is the realm or territory of Islam. Now, a uh, characteristic for that is that it is not an area where Muslims are in the majority. In fact, especially in the early period when they started to conquer territories outside of Arabia, Muslims were a minority for many years after. It took a very long time before you had a majority Islamization. You see that in the curve of Richard uh, Bouliet. Dar al-Islam refers to an area where there are sufficient conditions, that where, uh, or at least where the conditions are favorable enough for Muslim communities to live according to their own law and their own system. Voilà. That is the concept of Dar al-Islam. More importantly for our narrative on Central Asia are Dar al-Harp and Dar al-Ad. Dar al-Harp is the realm of warfare, the land of war, the land to be fought for, the land of jihad, both ideological and military jihad, strongly intertwined also in the history of Central Asia. There's an alternative notion of that as Dar al-Kofar, uh, the land of the unbelievers, the kafiru. Yeah, that's but okay, Dar al-Harp is an area where there are not yet sufficient conditions for Muslims to be governed or according to their own system and be sufficiently safe. Central Asia was actually Dar al-Harp for many centuries, at least even during Samanid rule. That was land to be fought. That was a frontier that, a frontier of the Ummah where there was some sort of permanent struggle, ideological and military, going on in order to secure it for what was to become then the Dar al-Islam. And then the last concept is the Dar al-Ad, that is the realm of truth, so the realm of covenant. That is very connected to the Dar al-Harp, the realm of struggle, the realm of war, the frontier land, but where Muslim polities and Muslim rulers have some sort of a deal with rulers from other culture, in exchange for a status or co-optation, there is no more struggle, a temporary situation. Also, Central Asia was Dar al-Ath for centuries, because of the co-optations of local rulers also belonging to other confessional systems. These two together brings that we deal with a prime example of what Karl Schmidt called a Großraum in German, a greater space that is uh, very strong interaction between a territorial space and a specific political idea. Concept of Grossraum, which fully applies here. Okay, now, when we go a bit further then in, um, in the process, gradual process of early Islamization, a number of things that I uh, want to say or that I will share with you in order to have a clear idea about what uh, what was at stake there and what happened there. The first question that may occur is before the implantation and the spread of Islamic religion and Islamic ideology, what was Central Asia like on different, uh, on different levels? Well, a number of benchmarks. First of all, demographically. Um, the population of Central Asia, including Xinjiang, nobody knows how much people live there. No censuses, no statistics, but McEvity and Jones, in their demographic atlas of history, so by the way, an excellent work published in 1979, eh, mention the figure of 2.6 million. Voila, 2.6 million for what we see as the five Central Asian countries and Xinjiang. To give you an idea, 
Iran was about 5 million. Iraq, they believe a million, not more. And then Arabia, uh, Western and interior Arabia, you can imagine it, the Red Sea, and then the inland of Arabia, 2 million. That are the populations we deal with, very different from today. They were much smaller groups, a different demographic pattern than you have today. That's the first thing, around uh, 630. Then, uh, politically, what was Central Asia like on the eve of Arab invasion and uh, Islamization? Then I refer to this map. A very rough sketch, politically, instead of po in, in, in terms of polity and uh, states, two great political cultural spheres that was, uh, which influenced Central Asia. That was the Iranian Empire, which was much larger than what Iran is uh, today, and which encompassed in the form of provinces, so-called satrapies, some parts of what is nowadays Turkmenistan. And then a second uh, civilization that had a big influence was China. We do not yet speak about the current province of Xinjiang, which became much, much, much later into being in, uh, in history. But the, the, the then Chinese dynasty, the Tang, if I am not mistaken, they had a protectorate, the, protect the protectorate general to pacify the West. And they had a presence in, with military outposts, representations, etc., in big parts of Central Asia, in what is now Xinjiang, but also deep into what is nowadays Uzbekistan. And then between the two, in the heartland of Central Asia, the sedentary areas, you had a whole patchwork of states and principalities held together by an Iranian influence culture, which you may know as the Sogians. But they were never a political unity. They were very under Iranian and then in the East, more Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, influence. Then in the East, uh, what is now Herat, you had dependencies of the Iranian Empire, like the Haftalids. They were a late outcome of a state that was much bigger. And then you had the steppe confederations in nomadic then. That's it. Socially, uh, Central Asia, what was it like? Um, it basically revolved around what pre-modern Central Asia revolved around for centuries and millennia. That was this complementarity between sedentary agriculture and then nomadic and semi-nomadic pastoralism that was already there. Enclaved, very enclaved, micro-regional based economies, sector like crafts, and then the trade routes that were still functioning, even if we're no longer talking about the heydays of the transcontinental systems that once connected China with the Mediterranean uh, basin. In that system, you see it's situated, Central Asia here, then the cradle, the cradle of Islam here, it's called the Hejaz, the Red Sea economic space. Yemen was also uh, part uh, of it. There was no direct interaction between the two. So again, the intermediary, the turning plate that linked these two spheres together were Iran and then Iraq, which early already in the development of Islam became its, um, became its political uh, center. And then, what is most of interest, the confessional geography of Central Asia prior to Islam. Again, a, a quick sketch, uh, what uh, confessional systems were dominant back then in Central Asia. Um, a first confessional system that was uh, widespread among the sedentary agricultural population of Central Asia was the system that was also predominant in the Iranian Empire and the state religion and the state religion there that was Zoroastrianism, yeah? the fire worshippers as they are popularly called. Different forms and variations of fire worshipping. I say different forms and variation because you had the official way of practicing that in the Iranian Empire. It was very enshrined in the state there. Yeah? But uh, when you look at daily practice of the vast majority of the worshippers in Central Asia, it was very mixed with local and micro-regional beliefs and practices. This is how it uh, was. 
Then a second uh, sphere present, that was the animism of the steppe. Then we go north in Central Asia, the Turkic people of the nomadic people who had their own animist systems. That was with much variation, but we will not go into detail. Then the presence of Abrahamic belief systems, of which Islam is one. But before Islam, they were present in Central Asia. In the form of Oriental Christianity, you may have heard about the Nestorians and Chaldeans. They, had, they were very active in Samarkand, in Herat. They were very active in what is now Kyrgyzstan and even among certain population groups in what is now Xinjiang, where there have been archaeological evidence of churches, institutions, etc. There was a Christian presence prior to Islam, but Oriental Christianity and also Judaism. But then Oriental Judaism, not uh, Central European Judaism, uh, that's, uh, that was, that's a totally other form. Mostly Iranian Oriental Jews who had installed themselves in a number of urban centers there in, uh, with the, the, the connections and phases of globalization that uh, occurred there. And then the last uh, system present was Buddhism. Mostly then in what is now Xinjiang, like the kingdom of Khotan, Kucha, they were until like a bit after the year 1000, for a long time, they were centers of Buddhist culture and civilization. It was also, there were theocracies also, was also their official, um, official uh, ideology. So then, if you have that, what explains then the total transformation in the wake of military conquest? Military conquest in Central Asia has been nothing new. Many invaders came uh, to Central Asia, set up states there, polities, etc. Some adopted confessional systems, others left their civilizational projects and belief systems and institutions, as we have discussed uh, uh, before. The latter happened then with Alexander the Great, the Greek Hellenic civilization, the Seleucid Empire, which succeeded it, and so on. Similar thing happened there in a pattern of military uh, uh, conquest. Very quickly how it went, so that you uh, are a bit oriented, you don't get lost in the dates, uh, etc. Actually, a process of conquest that started here in Western and Interior Arabia shifted to Iraq, which became the political center of the caliphate from the 7th century uh, onwards. It started then with the invasion of the Iranian Empire, roughly around the year 633. Yeah? Uh, the year 633, which then culminated in a decisive battle between the Arabs and the Iranians at al Qadisya uh, in present-day Iraq on the Euphrates, then the seizure of the capital, Iranian capital of Stesiphon, which was back then, it was not Tehran, it was Tessifon. And then it took a process of about 25 years before the territory of the Iranian Empire was sort of loosely conquered by the Muslim Arabs, not only by them, but also by local allies, which they gradually found into the, uh, the process. Two, uh, two year time slots that are of importance, 650-652, that is the conquest of the cities of Herat, which is situated here, Nishapur, and then Merv, these three. Merv is the only one in Central Asia probably, eh, situated in uh, Turkmenistan. Important because they would be the area for the establishment of frontier, Arab frontier colonies. We'll say a few words about that in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a moment. The implantation of physical representatives of the new order. Then another decisive date, 654, was the seizure of Derbent on the southern Caspian, which is nowadays situated in Dagestan, in the Russian, uh, in the Russian Federation. That gives you an idea about the itinerary, the pattern of, um, of uh, conquest. Then the conquest, the Arab conquest of the Central Asian heartland probably, present day Uzbekistan roughly, yes? In the, the area that the Arabs would call Al Bilat Al Mawara Al Nar, the land beyond the river, that is the Amudaria and the Panj then, yes? Al Bilat Mawara Al Nar is what they would call uh, Central Asia. That is situated between the year 706 and 714. Well, 
to give you an idea. Exactly at the same time that you had the Islamic invasions uh, into Spain. Well, that's uh, the whole other side of this geographic, uh, this geographic space. So it was multi-pronged and multi-vector with armies that had a high degree of autonomy in their roots and in their methodology. The Arab invasions, also under the Umayyads, never reached Xinjiang, except for one attempt in the year 715, documented quite in detail on the basis of historiographic sources by Hamilton Gibb, uh, one attempt in 715 that brought it almost to, uh, to, uh, into Kashgar. But for the rest, it never went as further as what is nowadays um, eastern, uh, eastern uh, Uzbekistan. Now, okay, that's just the general ready knowledge to give you an uh, idea. More importantly, where the impact of conquests in terms of victims, physical and so on, and what actually explains why a very sophisticated empire like the Iranian Empire succumbed to a, mi a minority group. First of all, in terms of uh, impact eh, on, uh, on the population. When I refer to the atlas, his uh, demographic atlas of McEverdy and Jones, what is very interesting there is in their graphics, you see between the years 600 and 700, a decline in the Iranian population between 15 and 20%. So really a decline in population, you can see there. Also, it was a bit what we call Monica work, a monk's work almost to reconstitute that. It's not without its critics, but we can do with, uh, with, uh, with that. Was the decline uh, caused by uh, Arab invasions, Muslim invasion, partially? But the thing is, uh, one of the reasons why the Iranian empire collapsed under these invasions is that it was already uh, on the wane itself internally. Yeah? It, have been, it had been involved in, a 20, in almost 25 year, uh, years of war with the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire. And then after that, Iran had a civil war uh, of four years during which there were 11 emperors or pretenders to the throne. So it was already internally weakened. Second lesson, still with current relevance, is that the Iranian Empire which was culturally very sophisticated, technologically also, they underestimated the capacity of their opponents, the ideological fervor of their opponents, ideology, ah, 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 as a motivation. They were thinking, well, we deal again with Bedouins from the periphery and with Turks and with Baluchi, these primitive nomadic tribes, so we will defeat them or assimilate them. It has happened many times before. But this time, they were also carrying an ideological project. And I think this cannot be stressed enough that this ideological fervor as a factor in uh, conquest. It's easy to see it all by just an opportunistic thing to get rich, right? To get booty. Material, money, uh, and, and, and taxes you can levy, etc. That's important, true. It played also, but here you had people who carried an idea of civilization or a civilizational concept according to their precepts and an ideological motivation, an ideology that gave them compensation in the afterlife if they were waging war for the new belief that was then, um, that was then Islam. Last factor, when you see the pattern of conquest, very important, you do not need to be a majority to defeat and occupy a civilization or a country. In fact, you see, including in Central Asia, Arabs, Arab warriors and their allies, which they recruited among other groups because they were not alone, they remained minorities all the time. There's a pattern through history that also in the Western Roman Empire, the peoples who invaded were actually numerically quite small. That was the case with the Muslim Arabs, the Bedouins and their allies in Iran, then in Central Asia. So it's not that they were flooded by Arab warriors and Bedouins. No, not at all. It was facilitated by a, a process of eternal disintegration. I will give you another example then, switching to Mediterranean Europe in the year 429, so when the Western Roman Empire was at its end, 
The Vandals, which you may know, eh? they were a nation once. Now we use it for something else. When they invaded Roman Africa, so this part, in the year 429, these two provinces had a population of 3 million. The Vandals themselves numbered probably not more than 80,000 people. Everybody together. Men, women, children, the elderly, and everything. And of them, only like about 15 to 20,000 were older than 15, so able-bodied men who could fight. So it was actually a small group, but they managed, in a process of internal disintegration, to get into there. What is also important is that local elites, people in power, actually were ready to make deals to betray and to get together with the invaders in the hope to get some position or to achieve a political agenda or an interest uh, or an, an, an interest uh, or push for a certain uh, interest. So then, the last point in this slide, that is a first implantation of, um, or a pattern of Islamization of uh, Central Asia, that is once you have a loose control, because the control of the Arabs in Central Asia, Iran, was quite loose and not undisputed for many years, there was resistance, it was also not obvious to, uh, to establish that or consolidate that. That is a first pattern, that is what I call enclave Islamization. Again, I repeat, the two patterns that can identify the enclave Islamization, which happens in specific geographic areas, through the transfer of populations already being representatives of the Islamic uh, Ummah. And then you have the second pattern, which will occur which occurred uh, later on, or of partly parallelly, that is uh, the indigenization of the Islamic ideology, where the basis shifts to other groups than the Arabs, and they take it over then, they champion the, uh, the cause. The establishment of Muslim Arab frontier colonies have been a first permanent implantation. And there were a number of areas where it occurred more than somewhere else. Uh, it's also, I mean, the sources differ very much and conflict very much in that, um, uh, in that, uh, in that respect. But some have it that uh, already 20 years after conquest, there was a gradual transfer of colonists from Iraq and Yemen to Central Asia. More specifically, uh, uh, Nishapur, Merv, and then also Herat, which were, I mentioned them, the prime areas of Arab colonization. And there I use, you, when I say colony, you have an idea of it in the modern sense, yes, than the 18th, 19th century, early 20th century sense. But colony is derived from the Latin coloniae, that means a permanent transfer of populations to area outside of their own geographic area. This is exactly what happened here, clear colonization through the transfer of physical representatives of the Islamic order to the frontier. Specifically happened in Merv, in Nishapur, and then a number of other places. Then we are already much closer into what we understand as uh, Central Asia. Now, the numbers are not clear. They vary from 47 to 50,000. Then again, some say it are 47,000 to 50,000 families. Others say, no, it were individuals. Very conflicting and a very different proportion according to the definition you give. But fact is, it has happened. There have been colonies, population transfers of Arabs or Arabized people who came mostly from present-day Iraq, Basra and Kufa, which is in the south of Iraq, and there were also Yemeni tribes who were transferred there. Again, when you look at the historical material that is available, the book of McEvady and Jones, they also notice in that period uh, a, sharp, uh, a certain drop in population in Western and interior Arabia and to a lesser extent in present-day Yemen, which was in part explained through conquest and the move of population groups to the newly conquered territories. Here also, this is a very classical idea and practice of empire. 
you transfer physical representatives of the center of the new order and the new ideological system into the periphery so as to control and consolidate it. Secondly, it went also with a reorganization and society, or of society and with the appearance of new political systems. Why were certain areas chosen more than others? It could, have to, it could have to do with strategic position, with the forepost, the idea of uh, frontier. There were also more uh, general practical factors at, uh, at play, like the availability of land, uh, the availability of space, because population, previous population had left or were chased away. That can uh, also uh, that can also have to do. The people who came there and settled there, they were of different pattern. There were families yeah, and there were also individual mutakilun that were male soldiers who then married locally. So that's already a first in-routing process. Okay, that's, uh, that's what happened. And then, most importantly, these people, these colonists, they only wanted to be governed uh, by one of their own people according to their own legal system. So, not by a local, regional uh, legal system, but they were forming self-ruling enclaves. Eh? And, uh, and uh, autonomous enclaves and, uh, and colony. Again, if you, uh, go, uh, go, uh, if you push it forward to actual relevance, in Central Asia, there are still groups and families who identify themselves as Arabs. In Tajikistan, in the Vakhsh Valley, Jilikur, I met some of these communities. I believe in Turkmenistan also. They will mostly no longer speak Arabic, but it has to do with genealogy. With genealogy, that goes in the family tradition that they trace it back to these tribes who were transferred. And even for many years after the arrival, these tribal loyalties, Kufa, Basra, Yemen, etc., continue to play a role in the self-identification and uh, political mobilization. Where are we in the time, uh, time shadow? Voila, exactly, it's perfect. Then we go to the second part.